My pleasure to introduce uh, Matthias Rudolf or Matze, as most people call him. <laughs> uh, he is actually works with Transolar Climate Engineering, and he recently also accepted an appointment as a faculty in the Academy of Arts and Design at the University of or at, in Stuttgart. Uh, he has been, I think, with Transolar since he graduated in mechanical engineering from Stuttgart, and he also has a degree from Northwestern. And okay. And we are happy to have you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. Oh, it's quite glary here. <laughs> So uh, thank you very much for your invitation. It's really great to be here and also to see uh, the development of so many simulation tools you're developing here at MIT. I think that's a real asset for the simulation community. And I want to talk today about uh, high density challenges and opportunities when we talk about uh, urban environments and cities. I think what is really interesting is high density. And uh, as already mentioned by the introduction by Alan, like, I, I think our biggest uh, challenge of society for the next decades will be really to reduce carbon emissions in order to limit climate change and lower the temperature of our planet. And within this, we uh, often look at energy performance and look at, at energy performance metrics based on floor area when we look at buildings. But sometimes floor area is misleading. And uh, ch just showing this picture uh, just gives you this misleading impression that like looking at the energy per square foot is really high for this place, but looking at per head, it's almost negligible. That means the quality of space really has an, is an important factor when we talk about our environments. And we have to bring energy performance and the quality of space together, because if you build our environment, which is really low energy, but nobody really uses it, then it's a waste of energy and resources. So this is what we try to do within climate engineering. We try to get these things together, energy performance and quality of space. So if, if you look at green buildings recently, where, uh, where sometimes you find buildings at a closer look, where you design a building which is quite wrong from the beginning, and then you add gadgets to it, like uh, some renewable energy, biomass, you put a bicycle rack, uh, PV, rainwater collection, a green roof, a wind turbine, and then you connect it to public transport and call it a day. <laughs> so this is kind of efficiency by gadgets. What we're really looking for is uh, an integrated performance by design, like this sailboat, which is really, the, the shape is optimized for passive design and the, the most effective use of wind. And the performance parameter, the, the optimization was speed and agility. So we come from Stuttgart, where uh, Gottlieb Daimler invented the car, so we love cars. Our whole economy in Stuttgart is based on cars. I don't know what to do if you don't have cars in Stuttgart, but we'll figure out something else. But uh, cars had been optimized the last century from, from this form to this form, and the main performance parameter was basically aerodynamics and drag coefficient. Drag coefficient is uh, responsible for about 50% of fuel consumption. And you can optimize that down to 0.16. And if you look at the curve of the drag coefficient over the last century, you see that it's uh, rather flattening out. And we have really aerodynamic cars right now, which really had a big impact on design. But this is not the only thing you have to optimize. You also have to optimize the other parameters, because otherwise you, you get stuck with your Tesla in a traffic jam. So you have to look at more parameters. And, at, and this becomes now interesting when you go away from single buildings, optimized buildings, to an urban environment where you have many more parameters to optimize and to play with in order to get a high quality environment and a high performance and low carbon emissions. So all of you know that now, nowadays more than 50% live in cities. It, the prognosis is that by 2050, 75% of the people will live in cities. So there's a, a, a big focus on cities recently and translating that uh, high quality space and low uh, and high performance to cities, we want to reestablish new goals in regards to carbon emissions and quality of urban life. 
And rather than the interior environment defined by the building, we also have to look at the quality of the outdoor environment, especially in cities. So I want to talk about opportunities first when it comes to high-density high cities. One, is, one opportunity is density in transport. Everybody knows this chart. This shows the proportion, the, the relation between fuel consumption per tran uh, for transport versus density persons per hectare. And it's clear the, the higher density you have in your city, the more economic feasible is public transport, which actually when decreases your fuel consumption per capita. But also public transport gives you other huge potentials. It frees up space, gives you a new quality of space in your city. The second opportunity is infrastructure, and uh, uh, Ralf Wagner already talked about that. If you have a high-density area, you can think about the in economic investment into uh, infrastructure like district heating and district cooling. Then this gives you the opportunity of various synergies. For example, a heat shift between cooling of offices at the same time you use that energy to heat uh, residential units or the use of co-generation units uh, um, to provide heating to residential, at the same time provide electricity for the city. For example, Frankfurt, 20% of the electric energy consumption in Frankfurt is just by data centers. So all this waste heat of data centers could be used within the city. So instead of laying all the data centers into the Pacific on an island, it would be more useful to place data centers into cities. But a positive thing plus a positive thing uh, does not really add up to something better. Um, this is an example of uh, district heating versus optimized uh, like high performance housing. And here you have an FAR of 0.5, FAR of 2 and an FAR of 3. Like in order to make um, a district heating economic feasible, you have to be price competitive. So if you want to have that, you have to sell heat at the price of 12 cents per kilowatt hour. And if you now have a development with a really energy aggressive standard like a passive house with 15 kilowatt hours per square meter of heating, which is about five kilo BTU per square foot in a year, then you see that if you do district heating, you have so little demand that 60% of your heating demand is basically heat loss through the pipes. And then just the heat loss plus the investment for the grid already is above the amount of money you could sell your heat for. So you need a certain density in order to make a good thing like a low energy building work with another good thing, an uh, infrastructure for district heating. For example, here with an FAR free, you have 8% heat loss and the investment for your grid and the loss is at 2.7 cent per kilowatt hour, which still leaves you 9.3 cent per kilowatt hour to provide heating. So what are the challenges? Challenges of high density is the urban quality. This is the timeline from the turn of the century until 2000, and this is kind of the public, the activity in the public realm. You can see at the turn of the century, people had to go outside for daily business. We had to shop and the, the chiller and the refrigerator hadn't been invented yet. So every day's life was on the street. Now with the invention of the refrigerator, people could actually stay at home or order pizza and they actually don't have to go outside. And even nowadays you don't have to go outside. You could stay probably a whole year at home, just order pizza, Netflix and do your home office. Uh, so you actually have to design outdoors to provide an invitation for the people to get public life. And public life is the quality that city can offer. So what is, what is public life? What do you have to provide for public life? First of all, you have to consider outdoor comfort. Why do, can, how can you design your outdoor space? You have to consider the outdoors like the indoors. It's kind of a living room of the public space. You have to design it for comfort, like this courtyard in, uh, in Morocco which is shaded, is surrounded by thermal mass, which provides a, a cool environment, and the, the leaves do some kind of evaporative cooling to this environment. And also, you have to provide outdoor comfort to promote walkability and 
and bike lanes so that people can use um, alternative means of transport instead of cars or public transport. So the Jan Gehl once said that the, the enemy of the public realm is wind. And uh, so wind is a real factor that one has to consider in master planning in terms of the outdoor comfort and pedestrian comfort. Another thing is daylight and solar access. Uh, this is a, a city block in Shenzhen. I think they have also other problems than just daylight <laughs> access and solar access problems. Um, but this is daylight and solar access not only for the buildings, which sometimes we have, but also for the public realm. So what is the process? Like these are the opportunities and challenges. And if you look at this process, we kind of within various competitions and projects we work together, uh, we kind of developed the process and we figured out that the implementation of design strategies is really very different than designing a building because you have these various scales of space and time and you have this dependency of scale. So the implementation of various strategies depend on the successful implementation at a different scale. For example, if you want to have daylight in your apartment in the city block, you have to successfully implement this design strategy already in the master plan. You can't fix that at the apartment level anymore. So, so first of all, you have to come up with a performance matrix. You have to define a design target for your master plan, whether it be daylight and solar access for the buildings or public realm, the pedestrian comfort metric, or the carbon emission metric. And then you have to test your, your urban design, your infrastructure, your, your public design against these performance metrics in each loop. If you succeed, then you have a solution, an optimized solution. If you don't succeed, you have to reiterate and mod kind of uh, adapt the design. This means that first of all, you need good simulation tools and you need uh, an integrated design team which is able to communicate and understand each other's perspective in order to fight for good solutions. Like here in the, I think that's in uh, Kazakhstan, the, the, uh, the, the parliament. So it's, a, it's not only a question of simulations tool, but it's also a question of the design team. So I brought you two case studies, uh, one from a very hot climate. You probably know Mastar. Mastar city is a, a development outside of Abu Dhabi, uh, developed by Foster and Partners. And Mastar is, uh, in Abu Dhabi has a quite hot and humid climate during summertime, a lot of sun and moderate in wintertime. And design goals were to create an outstanding living and working condition environment, replace fossil fuels by renewable, and create a zero carbon city. And one of the big goals was also a city of where you can live and work and a city of short distances, where the living and working is close and people walk, prefer to walk instead of using a car. But that in order to do so, you have to design outdoor space that people can actually really walk outside comfortable. Um, and make use of it. So we looked at perceived temperature. When you look at temperature in a room, you talk about operative temperature. If you go outdoors, you have more parameters like solar exposure. Um, the mean radiant temperature is not defined by your living wall, it's defined by the urban realm. And if you look at perceived temperature, for example, in the desert of, of Abu Dhabi, you, you have a perceived temperature of 67 degrees Celsius which is, I don't really know in Fahrenheit, my scale ends at 110 degrees Fahrenheit, <laughs> but it's uncomfortable. <laughs> but so if you add like hot walls next to this guy, like, I think it should get even violet here, it, it even ra raises, and this is a, a really similar condition what you get in central Abu Dhabi. In addition to being exposed to solar, you also are surrounded by hot surfaces of the buildings, so it gets even worse than in the desert. And our target was to get an environment which is below outdoor temperature, below outdoor air temperature. And this was the idea of the Mastar Arcades to create a shaded narrow streets uh, with, with thermal mass outside, which can cool down during nighttime and provide kind of a, a cool living room, a cool outdoor living room. Or the, the green gardens where the, the plants and the trees provide shading at the same time evaporative cooling. So these were kind of the design vision 
And one of the big questions was, what is the right street width and orientation for the master plan of Abu Dhabi in order to provide this outdoor comfort in the streets? And the result of various investigations in terms of impact on daylight of the building and also shading of the street by, by the adjacent buildings, we came to the conclusion that 45 degree out of north provides the best, um, the best results in terms of daylight, but also especially in terms of shading of that street. So we ended up together in the team with a grid which is rotated 45 by north, and then looking at wind conditions, there's the thing that in Abu Dhabi, hot winds, they come from northwest. So we had these northwest streets uh, breaking up in narrow streets so that the wind is basically not going into that street um, because it hits the wall and then you get kind of an offset of the streets. And we did various simulations with CFD to show like what is the length of the street that avoids the warm winds to enter those streets and that you, get, you can keep that microclimate created in, in the streets. On the, other, on the other hand, we wanted the cool winds to enter these streets. We have cool winds from the east, and there are these kind of linear parks through the city, kind of these uh, arcades which are shaded and planted. And at the same time, at these streets which run northwest, we install these kind of cooling, cool, cooling towers which capture these cool winds from, from the west and drags them into the streets to cool them during nighttime. So actually, it's a passive cooling system for this outdoor environment in the streets. Nighttime ventilation, Mr. Wagner. So this, this is Abu Dhabi downtown. Um, and this, this from Forster and Partners, we did an infrared image of Abu Dhabi downtown. And if you look at that, you get like the asphalt is at 57 degrees Celsius, which is way above comfortable. And you're surrounded by these hot buildings, and you can probably choose which one to die, either being driven over by the car or get heat stroke. <laughs> Both are really reasonable here. And this is uh, a shot now from the first part of Master. It's the Master Institute. So you can see you're surrounded by this kind of thermal mass. You're walk, you can walk in the shade. And air temperature is basically above ambient temperature. So the surrounding buildings act as a cooling source. So you can see our ground is at 33, half the temperature you get on the street, and 34, that's a person actually. And the walls are at 35. PV are slightly hot at 55, because like on all roofs, it's like a PV layer to provide electricity. And you can't be uh, run over by a car because com the complete mobility is underground. So the, the street width is not determined by, by the transport. So then there was another target, the carbon neutral city. We first, we looked at the buildings, the building stock, and if you would do master with the energy efficient uh, buildings that you have today in the United Arab Emirates, we wouldn't be able to provide enough solar, solar area on the site in order to offset the energy demand. So the first, the first conclusion was actually we have to reduce the uh, the energy demand of that buildings by at least 50%, and we ended up with this target of 80% in order to get enough space for photovoltaics on site. So we went through various simulations and optimization for that buildings, not only the energy performance, but also user behavior and appliances within those apartments, highly energy efficient appliances. And ended up for various programs like retail lab office, by a reduction of about 80%. And as Mr. Wagner said, I mean, that's kind of the simulated uh, targets. And what we got 2012 was basically the first monitor data by the residential area. And the residential energy number was uh, designed to 66, and right now it's 100 kilowatt hours per square meter versus the reference of 400. So we're still um, in real life, there's still opportunity to improve these numbers down to the, the theoretical numbers. So from hot to cold, I, I will show another case study from Helsinki, Finland. 
Um, this is the uh, a container harbor just next to downtown. This here up here is downtown, and Finland uh, Helsinki they decided to empty this container lot and another container lot near downtown and relocate it up north to a, a bigger harbor and to free up land for extension of Helsinki downtown. So this was an international competition and uh, we joined with, uh, uh, with big architects um, for this challenge. And the target was also, again, to create a low carbon, basically a carbon neutral new master plan uh, for mixed use on this lot of land. The problem was that there was already an existing master plan. So where not all parameters are free to modulate, we had to take this kind of master plan since the guy who worked at the city department worked on this master plan since 10 years. And at the same time, he was kind of in the, in the jury. It was a no-go to change it. My colleague, Matthias Schuler, was also trying it. He changed it and they lost. <laughs> so, but we also lost. <laughs> so. <laughs> so this is the climate in Helsinki versus Abu Dhabi. It's basically dark and cold. <laughs> and this is also the biggest challenge in Helsinki. So the, the biggest asset is to bring solar exposure on the facade and on the street. And this is what the existing master plan didn't do. So the streets were too narrow, the height of the buildings were too high. So the first thing we thought, yeah, we have to adapt the existing master plan uh, to allow daylight exposure on the street. So we cut down the existing master plan uh, according to azimuth and to program. So towards the residential units next to the building, we cut it down by solar exposure and towards the north where we had kind of planned to have office use mainly, we cut it down for, solar, uh, for daylight. So different angles depending on program and depending on azimuth. So by doing so, you create kind of this, kind of this new 3D envelope based on daylight and solar exposure versus through different programs, which at the end looks like a medieval city, for, but a, day, a daylighted medieval city. And you can see that this is at the equinox and blue is basically, dark blue is zero to one hour of solar exposure. And blue, you can hardly find any blue in here. So most of the time, you get solar exposure on all facades in the public space. So this is just the envelope, which does not really limit architectural design. You could do various buildings within your plot. And uh, one part of the competition was to design the Citra headquarters. So this parcel was divided by two. One part was residential with a courtyard. The other one was an atrium type building for the Citra headquarters, which had been kind of a natural ventilated atrium space, which served as a kind of covered outdoor space during winter time, where people can gather in the darkness of uh, Finland in winter time. So this was the design proposal by big architects. So for the carbon neutral city, the first thing was, of course, we have to provide climate responsible building design with low energy, then the next to provide high efficient service strategies. And the third one is to look at what kind of energy opportunities can we have on site. So we have multiple energy sources and the way we want to connect them is of course through a low carbon infrastructure, uh, a district heating and cooling network which connects all of the program and is connected to a seasonal storage. And one of the kind of assets on site was ships actually. Um, because like in, on this site, like, uh, there are four big ships coming and leaving every day, going to Tallinn and Sweden. And each of the ship has a, a diesel engine of uh, 57,000 horsepower. And typically, 57,000, <laughs> a lot of horsepower, 50% is basically heat loss, which is by, by cooling the engine through seawater. So the idea was, instead of wasting all this energy, we capture it in phase change material containers, and when the ships arrive on our site, they, they unload their heat into the granite thermal storage system, which is connected to the district heating system. And looking at the energy balance, a potential study, this showed that if the ships continue to operate through the next decade, but basically on an annual basis, all the heat just dissipated from the ship's engine, captured here and stored here, and transferred to the buildings could basically compensate the complete heating demand of this, of this half island. 
I mean, this was kind of a, a local asset. No. Okay. Shall I take it? <laughs> so the outlook, I come to the end, I have one minute. So both projects were kind of grand visions, but we are not living in, in, a, in the centuries of grand visions. Grand visions are in China at the moment, but we are more living, like uh, Rolf Wagner said, in the century of grand adjustments as our environment is already built so far and we can't do kind of a Buckminster full or cupola over it in order to solve our insulation problem. We have to think, we have to be more uh, creative in dealing with the building stock in terms of insulation, but also in terms of smart grids, smart heating grids, smart cooling grids. And also the next challenge is we have to be more creative in looking at designing densification instead of just adding floors on top which would then shade kind of the, the lower two floors completely. We, we should more think of like vertical pins, which would more kind of egalitarian, uh, democratically shift shade through the other apartments so that each apartment could still have sun, but only like one or two hours of shade. So we have kind of to break through some common sense and we need tools to evaluate these new ways of design. And also we have to design for climate change. We, have, we know that our climate will change and the summer of 2003 will be the usual, usual summer by 2050. So there will be changes also in our outdoor comfort and also the way we design outdoor comfort in outdoor spaces. And we have to think about how many people should live in downtown Boston in the future. This has also an impact on uh, public space. And we need design tools and smart people who were using it because we, we really don't know what to come, but we try our best to do scenario planning and get everything in. Thank you. Yeah, I think the, mm -hmm. for example, Paris, they did, uh, three years ago, they did a study on, um, on the outdoor comfort in Paris, and they came up with a city master plan, how to, like, to, what is the current state of uh, urban heat island, what are the challenges, what, what do we have to do to avoid overheating, with the climate change, like with rising temperatures, when typical summers of 2003 will hit us every summer. So they developed kind of in a city scale, kind of guidelines and measures in order to address these things. Where are some of the um, discrepancies between the modeling and the actual performance? It looked like a pretty large discrepancy uh, in the Mazdar. I think it was 60%, 65 versus 100. That's pretty large. Where do you think that differential is coming from that's that big? That's a good question. We should go into, I mean, we, we, we really know when, when we really do the monitoring. In Mastar, I can't really tell because we don't have, we are not obliged to do the monitoring. But I think one of the factors in Mastar is that there were really stringent requirements in terms of equipment and user behavior. I think this is one thing which could be a, a big difference. But what our like, experience with our projects where we do actually do monitoring, like the Manitoba Hydro Tower in Winnipeg, uh, was that it took us kind of uh, one and a half years to bring down kind of current, like actual energy demand down to the value that we predicted in thermal simulations. And a lot of things were kind of wrong pump, wrong, wrong control sequence, like ro just wrong equipment. Um, and, and also some things in terms of just tuning your control sequence to reality. And, but then if you do the monitoring and give feedback to the user and the facility manager, look, 
like simulation shows something different here. We, something goes really wrong on this floor. To do that, you have to implement kind of all this monitoring already in design. So you have to implement kind of a monitoring strategy and sensors and the program at early design stage in order to do so. But like with aggressive performance goals, like one of the biggest energy savers is monitoring. Company in Canada called Anna Modal, and so all these samples, and, uh, the DSD just wrote her thesis on that, who has these posters of first beam and energy model and then calibrating it as part of their services. They've done that for 40 buildings right now, and it's very successful. And it's, it's various things from unaccounted loads that you don't have to do during the week, as well as other details. If you're interested in that, it's a very fascinating uh, work to read, actually, and see how do you get to that process. <laughs> so with the with the, the modeling uh, work, we're seeing an interesting thing emerge now with respect to liability and being held accountable for what's predicted in the models when the owners take over the building and, and the energy loads, uh, the costs are, are something other than what the models predicted and, and having to be very careful in the way we convey the information that are being generated in the energy models. I'm curious if you're you're running into these kinds of issues at all. Um, not until today. <laughs> I, I think um, it's it's quite. I mean, I think that's qu quite difficult. Like because the energy modeler depends on what stage he's on. Like he's dealing with limited amount of information. Like for example, when he does the modeling, let's say in design development, like he misses complete construction, he misses commissioning, and then there has to be at least that non-standardized buildings, there have to be some kind of uh, time to really optimize that building. But for example, in Passive House, this is different. Passive House is kind of a standardized program, PHPP, which is really accurate and uh, optimized for our climate, the European climate. And uh, the building products are, are kind of standardized. And uh, the testing for on-site testing, for commissioning, for air filtration, everything is standardized. So you, you can almost guarantee, if you do the PHPP and you predict 15 kilowatt hours, that with a, within a really minimum range, you will achieve it. So I think if everything gets standardized, um, then I think liability is, is a more reasonable thing to do. This, uh, thanks a lot.